Dr. Bill Salas, when you contacted me about a prophecy that is overlooked, and then when I saw your information, I was totally shocked because it explains what's going on, but so many people overlook it, and it explains what's going to have to happen before the Ezekiel 38 war, which everyone is waiting for. It's, like, it's totally amazing. So explain. Well, yes, Jenny, and thank you for having me back on your program. Um, in Ezekiel 28, verses 20 through 26, we find a very interesting prophecy that may find application for our time, and it probably identifies Hezbollah in Lebanon in Bible prophecy. You know, when you look at ancient biblical prophecy, and if it's going to find fulfillment in our time, when it would come to like Hezbollah, for instance, and of course they're in the news with respect to their ongoing conflict going since October 8th with Israel, we look for places like Lebanon, of course, uh, that's where they hail from presently, Tyre, Sidon, Gabal, and also Zarephath. And I'll, we'll show a map on for your viewers. Now, these cities are the subject of Bible prophecies, and I believe they're yet to be fulfilled. And we find Sidon is a really big one that no one is talking about in Ezekiel 28. Uh, the problem that some people have right now in the focus on Ezekiel 38 so heavily, which is a very important prophecy. It talks about Russia coming together with Turkey and Iran and a coalition. Nine different populations are listed in Ezekiel 38 verses 1 through 6. Uh, that that prophecy is going to happen. It's going to be a marquee event. Uh, God, they're going to invade Israel for plunder and booty. Uh, God's going to stop that supernaturally because that is too formidable of an offense to come against Israel. It says that's going to happen in the latter days. But a lot of people are focusing on that, putting that on the front pages of the prophetic calendar. And the problem with doing that, so in doing that, is that there's certain things that get overlooked. First of all, uh, the countries around Israel that share common borders with Israel, that would include those countries that fought against Israel in 1948, 1967, and 1973. Well, they're not in Ezekiel 38. That would be Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. And of course, within those countries, you have groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Palestinians, just to name a few. They're involved in another prophecy, and I think Hezbollah may be involved in that prophecy, and that's in Psalm 83. And those are inner circle of countries that do share common borders with Israel. They've been Israel's notorious enemies from time immemorial. We've talked about this on your show before, Janie. But that prophecy has to find fulfillment so that Ezekiel 38 can find fulfillment. Because Ezekiel 38 talks about a Israel that is going securely in the latter days, uh, without walls, bars, nor gates, in the midst of the land, people brought back from persecution. Uh, Russia is going to come after plunder and booty in that prophecy, very important. But that prophecy is not ready to happen because of what we're going to talk about today in Ezekiel 28, 28 verses 20 through 26, Psalm 83. And even Obadiah talks about Zarephath, we just mentioned, and that is an interesting prophecy too. So we need to look at Ezekiel 28 verses 20 through 26, Janie, because it's talking about a prophecy in Sidon which is about 50 miles north of Israel. It is a prophecy that talks about a, a slaughter that's going to happen. The, the scriptures actually talk about a sword that will come into that into uh, Sidon, which is where Lebanon has a presence there, a stronghold. Uh, there's going to be a lot of wounded and a lot of killed, etc. And it's a prophecy that's not has sound fulfillment yet. So I'd, I'm excited to talk about this prophecy and introduce it to your viewers today. But first, I'm excited too, and you also prove, and you'll be going into this later, why that has not been fulfilled um, in the past, but keep on going. Okay, well, let's talk for a minute about uh, Sidon, and let's actually do a bit of a Bible study here. We're going to Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 20 through 22. I'm going to read, there's actually six verses, we're going to go through 20 through 26, but we'll start with the first two. I'm going to go between a couple of translations off and on as we talk because it kind of gives us different camera angles of description uh, of the event. Um, again, this prophecy, in my estimation, is unfulfilled and probably could be the very next prophecy, Janie, to find fulfillment. And it does, I do believe, identify Hezbollah. In it. And as we record this, there's very deep concerns that there will be an all-out war coming soon between Israel and Hezbollah. You know, Hezbollah has been... Uh, having cross-border attacks with Israel. As of June of this of 2024, there's over 7,400 cross-border attacks between, between Hezbollah and Israel. And that was back in June uh, of this year. So there had been in a war already, but it's not been on the scale of the, of the potential 
that we're talking about here. So let's look at the prophecy, and then let's look at maybe some of the headlines that are going on now to show why this finds connection with today and the current events that are going on. Um, Sidon, like I said, is about 50 miles north of Israel. It's about 20-some miles north of Tyre. These are coastal cities. Uh, we'll talk about Tyre shortly. I believe they also are in a prophecy with Hezbollah, but we're focusing on Sidon now, S-I-D-O-N. It's the third largest city in Lebanon. It's also known as modern-day Sida, S-A-I-D-A. And here's what Ezekiel says about 2,500 years ago. And he says in Ezekiel 28, verses 20 through 22, here we go. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, turn your face to the city of Sidon and prophesy against it. Give the people of Sidon this message and from the, from the sovereign Lord, I am your enemy. O Sidon, and I will reveal my glory by what I do to you when I bring judgment against you and reveal my holiness among you. Everyone will know watching that will know that I am the Lord. So what we see here in this first verse here is that the Lord is against Sidon for some reason. We're not told why yet. We'll find that out shortly. Actually calls himself the enemy of Sidon. And he's going to bring a judgment upon this place. And the judgment will be of the magnitude that the onlookers will realize, hey, that's the holy God. That's the God of the Bible. So we have to see, well, what are those details? We start to find out a little bit more as we go into Ezekiel 20, verse 23, the next verse. I will send a plague against you, and blood will be spilled in your streets. The attack will come from every direction, and your people will lie slaughtered within your walls. Then everyone will know that I am the Lord. Again, he repeats that. Everyone will know that I am the Lord. He says, I will, in the New King James Version, will compare it to the New Living Translation we just read from. I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword, by the sword on every side. Now, the sword... It's a biblical typology for war. So we're talking about Sidon being involved in a conflict, a very, a very devastating conflict, with a lot of slaughtering inside the streets, a lot of wounded, etc. cetera. Uh, we don't know why yet, and we don't know who's involved just yet. So we're going to read a little further to find that out. The next verse is Ezekiel 28, verse 24. No longer will Israel's scornful neighbors prick and tear at her like briars and thorns, but then they will know that I am the sovereign Lord again. He repeats that. Heavy emphasis on whatever is going to happen. The outcome will be onlookers will realize he is the sovereign Lord. The New King James puts it this way. And there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all those who are around them, who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. So what we find out here, the reason the Lord is against Sidon and calls Sidon his enemy is because they're among the people around Israel that surround them, who despise them, who are likened by Ezekiel to a pricking briar or a painful thorn. And we're going to read one more, the end of the passage, verses 25 and 26, to understand the, why the timing is probably now. But here's the, the main point. <clears throat> right now, uh, Sidon, with the presence of Hezbollah in it, is serving along with those other countries around Israel. We talked about them in the inner circle of countries that share common borders with Israel. They are a pricking briar to Israel and a painful thorn. And, of course, we're seeing that on the news right now. I mean, the bombs that are coming in, the evacuations that are taking place in the northern part of Israel, of about over 80,000 Israelis have been exiled into their, mostly into their country, living out of suitcases, many of them, because of this pricking briar and painful thorn that they're dealing with around them, especially to the north in Lebanon with Iran's proxy, Hezbollah. And we'll talk, we can talk, show permitting, time permitting, a little bit more about who they really are. But we want to go out with the final verses so we can really get this prophecy into your viewers' understanding. It's, thus far, we've talked about Sidon uh, being a part of a group of countries around Israel that despise Israel. Uh, the judgments will need to be exercised upon them because they're like a pricking briar and a painful thorn. Okay, we're going to go to Ezekiel 28, verses 25 and 26. And this is going to tell us a very important fact about Israel and how they're someday going to dwell securely and be freed from this problem around them, especially to the north, especially in Sidon, especially with Hezbollah. And here's what it says, capstoning the... The passage itself, Ezekiel 28, verses 20 through 26. 
verses 25 and 26 say, Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and hallowed them in the sight of the Gentiles. Well, let's talk about that just briefly. Uh, we're talking about the regathering of the Jewish people out of the nations of the world for 1878 years. They were dispersed into the nations of, of the world starting in 70 AD. The Roman Empire conquered Jerusalem and burnt, burnt down the second Jewish temple all the way to May 14th of 1948. 1878 years dispersed into the nations, the Jewish people finally come back in a miraculous restoration of the nation of Israel in May of 1948. That's being talked about here. When I've regathered them, the house of Israel, from among all those people, and I'll be held in them in the sight of the Gentiles. And then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave my servant Jacob. That Jacob, of course, was later renamed Israel in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. So we're talking about Israel, the land I've given to my servant Israel. And they will dwell safely there. And they will build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. That pricking briar, that painful thorn we talked about. Again, he says, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Now, he's emphasizing not just the pricking briar and the nations around them will know that he's the Lord, but also now Israel, when, when they see this happen, they also will know that he is the Lord their God. So... And, and a summary here of the prophecy that I think could be happening in stage setting presently, the people around Israel that despise them will have judgments executed upon them. And we can talk about how that's going to come forward, time permitting. Um, they will no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn to Israel's side. Israel will be a safe dwelling. They will be a home building and a vineyard planting country. And right now we know that that's not the case because you have Hezbollah uh, causing problems to the north. There's certainly not, tourism's at a standstill. They're certainly not building houses and planting vineyards. Matter of fact, um, they've been starting fires in northern Israel, so the, the land is becoming burnt, and et cetera. So this is all in the news as well. So basically, God has to deal with this. Because remember, we talked about in Ezekiel 38, that Israel will be dwelling securely, without walls, bars, nor gates in the midst of the land prospering in receipt of great plunder and booty. That's what Russia forms its coalition to obtain. They're coming after that plunder and great booty. Israel can't, it's not in that condition right now. They've got walls all around. They've got walls to the north, especially trying to keep Hezbollah out. Uh, Hezbollah has been building tunnels, digging tunnels, of course, to get under those walls for the attempt of a ground invasion into Israel. Uh, one of the things they have accomplished in their attacks of Israel since October 8th is they have taken, like I said, about 80,000 Israelis from the north and, and unsettled them. So they're living, putting a burden on the Israeli economy as well as, you know, killing tourism. And basically, these are people who really could serve. Most all of the Israelis, men and women, have been involved in the military. That It's a mandatory draft. So by getting these 80,000 people out of the north through this uh, attacks they've been doing, They've actually gotten rid of potential combatants that they would have to encounter should they come across the North in a ground invasion, which they've talked about doing, and they're prepared to do that. So it's, it's part of their plan in the first phase was to do the things we just talked about, um, get these people out of the area so they could not be combatants against Hez Hezbollah in a ground invasion, hurt Israel's economy tourism-wise, putting a burden on them with the refugees. Also, they've accomplished another thing in this first phase, a couple things. And one of those things is they've um, basically been able to deplete a lot of Israel's uh, military arsenal, namely their Iron Dome. Uh, they've also been able to dilute the Israeli uh, troops, some to the south where the Gaza fighting is going on, on the Gaza, and then some to the north now as they have, have had to engage with Hezbollah. So on October 7th, we had the Hamas attack on Israel, and on, and on October 8th, we had Hezbollah gain in in support of the Hamas uh, the day after that attack by Hamas. So they've been depleting their arsenals. They've been causing Israel to deploy troops to the north that, were, that could have been used in the south. Uh, the other thing, too, is they've caused, given time now in this first phase, phase before perhaps an all-out war. In the first phase, they've given time for the international community to come against Israel. We see this happening with the anti-Semitism on the college campuses that have become very pro-Palestinian, especially in America. 
We see this with the International Criminal Court. They are now wanting to indict Benjamin Netanyahu on war crimes. And then also, the other thing they've accomplished, and the very major thing we need to talk about, is that they have enabled Iran more time to prepare nuclear weapons that they can put onto their nuclear warheads. They have hypersonic ballistic missiles that can hit Israel in uh, 400 seconds at 6.66 minutes and can carry a nuclear warhead. They travel five times the speed of sound. So all these things are going on right now, and Israel is going to have to deal with this, Janie. And I think one of the first things they're going to do is going to start getting prophetic, and it's going to start getting with this, dealing with the Sidon prophecy. Right. And it's it's just interesting because with the Sidon prophecy that I haven't heard anyone ever talk about before, I mean, it has to set the stage for Ezekiel 38. There was always missing pieces with Ezekiel 38, and you brought up the objections, you know, even uh, the unwalled villages, which I would never hear anyone address, And but all of this does have to happen. So, yeah, please explain more. Well, why don't we, um, why don't we move forward to the time right now and look at a few headlines and see what the real threat is and how come Hezbollah has a uh, stronghold in Sidon and why that becomes such a big deal now for, you know, like why God is considering that area, you know, his enemy. Um, first of all, let's talk about the fact that it recently it came out that uh, in the headlines that Israel is ready for phase two, pretty much I'm saying phase two. Uh, we just discussed phase one of Hezbollah's conflict. Phase two, Israel came out with Al Jazeera on June 19th of 2024. And the headline reads, Israel ready for an all-out war in Lebanon. All-out war. Um, it strikes on Haifa. This is on the Jerusalem Post on the day after, on June 20th, after that headline from Al Jazeera. Strikes on Haifa and Tel Aviv. Hezbollah's plan of attack if war erupts with Israel. So now we're talking about no longer just the northern cities of Israel, we're talking about Haifa and Tel Aviv, are within the scope of Hezbollah's plans, and they have precision-guided missiles. Here's some post, October 23rd of 2023. Uh, this was just a couple weeks after Hezbollah got engaged with Israel on October 8th. Hezbollah has up to 200,000 rockets aimed at Israel. 200,000 rockets. Hezbollah is a medium class army. In other words, a medium-sized army. Uh, as far as all world armies go, they're world class with 200,000 missiles that have been supplied to them from Iran. Uh, they were supposed to dismantle all their weapons back in 2006 after that 34-day conflict they had with Israel. They lobbed 4,000 missiles into northern Israel for 34 days in the summer of 2006. And UN Resolution 1701 was said that they, could, they had to dismantle all their weapons as well it did. And they had to actually move territorially back to the north of the Slatani River, which is what Israel wants, you know, presently, just go back to United Resolution 1701, get Hezbollah well out of there, that southern part of Lebanon, and have them dismantle. But at this point, that's not going to happen because they've got 200,000 missiles provided to them primarily from Iran, and some of those are precision-guided, and they can hit pretty much a bank of targets anywhere inside of Israel. We just talked about Haifa and Tel Aviv with pinpoint accuracy. So basically, uh, just for your viewers to understand who Hezbollah is and the threat they pose, uh, were, they were founded in 1982, conceived by Muslim clerics and funded by Iran primarily to fight the Israeli invasion of Lebanon back at that time. In Arabic, it's called the Party of God, and it's a Lebanese Shia Islamic political party. It's also a paramilitary group since 1992. It's actually been led since 1992 by its secretary general, Hassan Nasrallah, and they've got a political uh, presence in the parliament as, as well as this military, paramilitary aspect that we got, and they're very dangerous, much more dangerous than Hamas. So we're looking at a situation where this is probably going to escalate, and when it does escalate, this, mid, this northern border war with Israel and Hezbollah, we're probably going to see this prophecy find fulfillment. It's just going to have, likely send ground troops in. We have other texts we can look at in this program that kind of illustrate that. To move their ground troops up to the north. They're preparing to do this a ground invasion into Hezbollah. And it wouldn't be too far coming into the north that they would reach Sidon. Like I said, it's just about 20 miles past Tyre and about 50 miles north of Israel, Janie. Now, with Sidon, um, are there, is, you had explained, I've heard you explain before, like what, like um, military equipment in, in Sidon. Can you just explain that? 
like why yeah. that yeah that's an important point because basically you know why Sidon? That that's really the question right well first of all let's talk about the real footprint they've got in Sidon. there's this group called the lebanese resistance brigades that are f funded by hezbollah uh they're a paramilitary group they were founded by Hezbollah in 1997, five years after Hassan Nasrallah became the Secretary General. They recently have resurfaced again and par have been participating in the war since October 8th between Israel and Lebanon. They're composed primarily of Sunni Muslims and non-practicing Shias, so Saudi um, Sidon is predominantly Sunni Muslims. However, Hezbollah is a Shiite group founded by Iran. But these are... Sunni Muslims who hate Israel. And Hezbollah has embraced them into these Lebanese resistance brigades. Uh, they were created primarily to increase the manpower of anti-Israel forces and to, not, to deny Israel freedom of movement inside the non-Shia areas of the Middle East, mainly in Lebanon. Uh, one of their leaders we see is Mohammed Saleh. He is, hails from Sidon. It is an active reading active region where these Lebanese brigades are primarily stationed in Sidon. They've been involved in the clashes we, we talked about. So it's important to note that they exist there. That is the stronghold, the presence that Hezbollah has there. And also, uh, some headlines came out recently. This is the point I want to make before I read these headlines. Israel is already bombing this area. It's like Israel is already bombing around Damascus. And Damascus in Isaiah 17 is a prophecy that talks about Damascus someday ceasing from being a city and being a ruinous heap. And we're told that's in Isaiah 17.1. In Isaiah 17.9, it says, the desolation will be caused by the children of Israel. And it says in his strong cities, meaning Damas in not just Damascus, but Syria, like where Aleppo is to the north and Homs and Hamad, et cetera, the strong cities will be desolation caused by the children of Israel. Israel's been bombing Aleppo. They've, they've taken out the airport of Aleppo. They've been bombing around Damascus. They've been bombing around Sidon. So, I mean, one of the th reasons why I'm looking at this very closely as a timely prophecy for our time, as I do Isaiah 17, is they're already engaging in bombing these areas. Now, here's a headline that says, Oh, this is in February 19th of 2024 from the Times of Israel. It says, the IDF strikes Hezbollah arms depots deep inside Lebanon after a drone attack on the north, the north of Israel. And it goes on to say, the Israeli Defense Forces on Monday afternoon struck what it said were two weapons depots belonging to the Hezbollah terror group near Lebanon's southern coastal city of where? Sidon. So they have weapons depots inside of Sidon. Uh, some of them, those weapons are likely precision-guided missiles that are pointed at Israel that are about ready to come out and be launched against Israel. Another article that connects the footprint of Hezbollah with Sidon, Al Jazeera says on March 1st of 2024, as Israel strikes all around it, fear rises in Lebanon's Sidon. Reeling from successive crises, crises the people of Sidon worry that the next one could come in the form of Israeli bombs. So even the people of Sidon are very concerned right now. Um, we're going to look at another prophecy time permitting in Zarephath where it talked about some evacuations that were going on because they've been evacuating in, in southern Lebanon also, not just northern Israel. Uh, so these places, some of these places have not yet been evacuated, but I'm going to suggest to you pretty soon you're probably going to watch some of these southern country, southern cities in Lebanon subject to Bible prophecy. Tyre we'll get to in a moment. They're below Sidon. Zarephath is between Sidon and Tyre. And Gabal is north of Beirut. These cities are going to be involved in prophecies. And you're probably going to start seeing evacuations even happening as Israel moves into, likely moves into these towns and these evacuations. So these are the people that are concerned in this article. They're worried what's next, what could come, maybe in the form of Israeli bombs. They're already attacking these areas, Janie. So to me... Uh, this is one reason why I don't think it's been historically fulfilled. There are other reasons as well. And it's important to look at that as also because some people will say, well, that's already happened at the time of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, which is the primary argument that it has happened historically. Or that maybe happened in 350, excuse me, 351, when the Persian king um, Artaxerxes Oxus uh, raised the city with fire, uh, etc. So time permitting, we can get into those as well. But to me, 
We've got a, a Sidon is representative of another uh, of a group of countries around Israel that despise them. God plans on executing judgments upon them so that Israel can be safe dwelling, home building, and vineyard planting, which they're not able to right now. I think the first thing that happens in this these judgments around those who despise them is Sidon goes down. I think that's why they're listed in verses 20 through 24, along with verses 24 through 26, a whole group of belligerents that form a pricking briar and a painful thorn in Israel's side. Again, these are the countries. They are an inner circle of countries that share common borders with Israel. I've harbored an ancient hatred of Israel from time immemorial. They came against them in the wars of 1948, 1967, and 1973. They are also listed in Psalm 83. And I think that is the next prophecy where you're going to find Hezbollah, if you want to talk about that one here shortly. Okay, now can you just go over the Ezekiel 28, 20 through 26 prophecy again? Because now that you've explained so much, I just if you wouldn't mind reading that again. Okay, let me go right there and we will do that again because I think it is the one to be watching for as we've been talking about. Okay. The Burden Against Sidon, Lebanon by Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, verses 20 through 26, verses 20 through 22. Basically, again, we're going to say, this is what Ezekiel says, Then another message came to me from the Lord, Son of Man, turn and face the city of Sidon and prophesy against it. Give the people of Sidon this message from the Sovereign Lord. I am your enemy, Sidon. And I will reveal my glory by what I do to you when I bring judgment against you and reveal my holiness among you. Everyone watching, and the world will be watching, will know that I am the Lord. Now, that's not necessarily, in my estimation, a salvation knowledge. That's an acknowledgement. Hey, that was God. That, that type of judgment that's going to happen. We haven't really talked about the judgment yet. We can, time permitting. But the judgment's going to show the onlookers that Hey, that's God that's been involved, that's uh, being glorified there. And it goes on to say in verse 23, some of the details of the judgment. I will send a plague against you and blood will be spilled in your streets. This is war. The attack will come from every direction and your people will be slaughtered within your walls. Remember, they were concerned about the next attack being Israeli bombs. Okay, that was on the headline we just read. Then everyone will know that I am the Lord. Again, this is a central theme of, these, of this passage. God is going to be glorified in this judgment as he removes the pricking bar of countries around Israel, starting, in my estimation, with Sidon. The New King James said, There will be pestilence upon her and blood in her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword again on every side. We're talking a military conflict, the sword, a biblical typology of that. Verse 24, why? Why, God, are you against Sidon? Why is Sidon your enemy? No longer will Israel's scornful neighbors prick and tear at her like the briars and thorns, but then they will know that I am the sovereign Lord, the new King James. And there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all those who are around them, who despise them, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Are there people, I ask your viewers, are there people around Israel who have conflicted with Israel and despised them, as Ezekiel is saying, that served to be a pricking briar and a painful thorn to Israel's side? Ezekiel says they are, and they're the people around Israel, and that includes Sidon and those countries that share the common borders with Israel. It goes on to tell us the results about the judgments that's going to happen um, in the final two verses of Ezekiel 28, verses 25 through 26. Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from all the peoples among whom they are scattered. Again, we talked about this before. I want to say it again because it's very important to note. 1870 years, 78 years, dispersed in the nations of the world. No ethnic group in its history ever lived outside of its homeland for more than 400 years and ever returned to be restored in their homeland. The rebirth of Israel in 1948 fulfilled numerous prophecies, and it is a miracle of God. It's not an accident of history. So he says, When I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among them who they have been scattered, that's the worldwide dispersion. Uh, they've been brought back into the land in 1948, and I will be held in them in the sight of the Gentiles. Then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob, 
and they will dwell safely there, and they will build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely. But when? Something's got to happen. When I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them, then they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. You know, it's interesting that it says two times in this two verses uh, that Israel will dwell safely, they will dwell securely. The Hebrew words are Yeshavatak. The same two words show two times in Ezekiel 38, and they will dwell securely and dwell safely. They can't do that yet. They have to have these judgments executed upon those around them who despise them, and then they will dwell securely, and then that's when Ezekiel 38 can happen. Okay, Bill, before we get into where else Hezbollah is found in the scriptures, um, I just want to you know, say thank you. And thank you for those who are watching. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the channel. Okay, Bill, uh, this is very interesting because it's you have found Hezbollah described in different prophecies in the scriptures. So can you talk about that further? Yes, um, well, let's move on from the prophecy of Sidon in Ezekiel 28. Um, it's kind of interesting because Sidon is not listed in this other prophecy we're going to talk about in Psalm 83. It's not mentioned along the other cities and you know, territories that we're going to talk about here shortly. But I do believe in Psalm 83, a prophecy written about 3,000 years ago by Asaph, who was a worship leader for King David. We're also told in 2 Chronicles 29 30 that he was a prophet. And he writes this psalm, Psalm 83, that I do believe also is for our time and involves those countries we just talked about that are a pricking briar and a painful thorn to Israel's side that share common borders with Israel. And he writes 3,000 years ago. I'll just briefly talk about the a few verses, and we'll try to find Hezbollah in, inside of this prophecy. He Basically, what he says here in Psalm 83, verses 2 through 5, for behold, your enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. Of course, that would be Israel, the Jewish people. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. Let's wipe them off of the map. I'm paraphrasing. That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. They have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. And we're going to find out who they are in just a moment. But I do want to say something here at the headline that um, it says here they want to cut Israel off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. So far, we're being told that a confederacy is going to come together with the goal of wiping Israel off the map. And they're going to form a crafty council, a devious plan to do that, part of their confederacy. It's a contemporary confederacy. We're going to find that out shortly, not a chronological ordering of Israel's enemies. I find this fascinating that a headline came out in February of 2024. It says from Haaretz News, Nasrallah, remember he's the Secretary General of Hezbollah. Nasrallah says Hezbollah is committed to fighting Israel until it is off the map. So this is right off the pages of Scripture. I mean, this is what they want to do. And Hezbollah right now is in the fray. They are the main concern that you're doing this right now. Of course, they're a proxy of Iran. So Iran is you know, the, the head of the snake, per se. But we're, we're talking about Hezbollah in this show. So that's basically what their plan is. Now, who are these belligerents? We're told uh, by their old, their ancient names, and we'll put a, a modern-day equivalence on who they are shortly. The Tents of Edom and the Ish Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarines, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Felicia, the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria has also joined with them, and they have helped the children of Lot. The children of Lot would be Jordan, and that listed above there would be Moab and Ammon. Is who being identified there being helped by Assyria? Their goal, we're told in 73 verse 12, we want you know, we want to wipe Israel off the map, they say. Why? Because let's take ourselves the pastures of God, the promised land for a possession. They don't want a two-state solution. They don't want a Jewish state. They want another Arab state, namely Palestine. Now, as we look at this list of belligerents, who we find out who these guys are, the tents of Edom. Um, you can see on the image here, more than likely represent the Palestinians, the Edomites, uh, ancient Esau's, uh, Esau was Jacob's twin brother. Jacob was later called Israel. Esau fathered the Edomites, and they have ethnical representation in the Palestinians today. Tents of Edom, likely representation of the Palestinian refugees. Tents of can represent um, uh, refugee conditions. And we see that as of 1948, after the War of 1948 and 1949, 
the tents of Eden became a reality. The Palestinians became refugees. Before that time, they were known as the Arabs of Palestine, 1948. Now that area is going to be called Israel. And then therefore, after the war of 1948, you have what this push to be called Palestine, the Palestinian refugees. So they, they became a reality in 1949 per se. You also have the Ishmaelites. That would be where the Saudis are. He was, Ishmael was the father of the Arabs. Moab would be central Jordan, including Palestinians. Almost 60% of Jordan's population are Palestinians. Hagarines would likely represent Egyptians. Hagar was the matriarch of Egypt. Gabal is northern Lebanon, and I believe we're going to find Hezbollah in there, maybe Hezbollah. Again, it's just, just above Beirut. Modern-day name of that place, by the way, Gabal is now Biblos, B-Y-B-L-O-S, if you're looking for it. Amman, the Palestinians and the northern Jordanians. Uh, Amalek would be the Arabs of the Sinai and Negev Desert. Felicia would be where the Gaza is, and that's where the Hamas are. We're going to find an interesting observation between them and Hezbollah shortly in this prophecy. Tyre, uh, the inhabitants of Tyre was identified. That would be where the southern Lebanese are. That Tyre is about 20 plus miles north of Israel. On the coast, Gabal and, and Tyre and Sidon are on the coastal cities of Lebanon. And Assyria, which at the time Asaph wrote, would have included the Syrians and the Iraqis. So they, should, they form this uh, inner circle of countries that surround Israel. Now, I'll find an interesting observation here. If we go back and talk about the inhabitants of Tyre, they're listed in a habitation condition. The only other belligerent in this 10-member confederacy listed in a habitation condition are the tents of Edom. And we talked about them representing probably the Palestinian refugees. But why the inhabitants of Tyre? None of the other locations are talked about being in habitation condition. Well, the Hebrew word is yeshav, and it can mean a people put in place and enthroned and empowered in that habitation. And that's exactly, could be, in, well, I think this could be, we're talking about Hezbollah here, because that's exactly what happened with Iran. They established them in Lebanon and empowered them and put them in place. So is it possible that that reference to them being in a habitation condition draws our attention to Hezbollah as being mentioned in this prophecy? I think it's possible. It's also important to note that alongside the inhabitants of Tyre in this verse is Felicia. Felicia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Now Felicia is where the Hamas are in the Gaza, another proxy of Iran. And these are the two big conflicts as we record this that Israel is engaged in. Uh, conflicts with Hamas in the Gaza and now they're being spread thin to the north in a conflict with Hezbollah. Uh, this whole thing may blow up into a big mushroom problem, a, a big war escalation, as we've been talking about, with, especially with Hezbollah. So then also it's interesting to note in that same verse, Gabal is mentioned as part of this confederacy. So therefore, I think we have, and that's in Lebanon, I think therefore we have a reference here in verses 6 through 8 to Hezbollah, and even maybe perhaps Hamas as Felicia. So uh, that prophecy is very important also. I think what and, and again, that's those those populations that are, are around Israel that are pricking by and a painful thorn to Israel that prevent them from being a safe dwelling, home building, and vineyard planting nation that God wants them to be, according to Ezekiel 28, verses 20 through 26. Okay, now can you also explain, um, looking at Hezbollah, uh, possibly in Obadiah? Yeah, let's go look at that because I think this deserves an honorable mention. Um, we're told in Obadiah, let's first look at the uh, Palestinian prognosis. I think it's important to do that. Obadiah 1.18. It says, The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. Now, this is the Israeli defense forces, uh, Jacob and Joseph. But the house of Esau, remember the tents of Edom, the Palestinians, Esau fathered the Edomites, they shall be stubble. And there shall be no survivor that will remain in the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Now that is a powerful prophecy. Hasn't found fulfillment yet. Jacob will have descendants. Israel will have descendants. They will populate the Messianic kingdom when Jesus Christ returns in the second coming and reigns on the earth for a thousand years. And you find the account of that in many places, but especially Revelation 20, you have this thousand year period. Uh, 
Israel is going to have descendants. They're going to have, in fulfillment of a prophecy that God gave to Abraham in Genesis, he's going to have descendants as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And it goes on to say, in verse 19, it's worth reading, after this conflict, Israel is a, a, a fire, per se, and Israeli defense forces is who I'm putting on and connecting there, who, by the way, they exist in fulfillment of Bible prophecy and numerous Bible prophecies. I hate to keep rabbit trailing, but I think it's important for your viewers, Janie. Ezekiel 37, 12, uh, 10 tells us that the, the Jews are going to come out of a Holocaust condition when they feel their hope is lost, their bones are dry, and they're cut off, we're told in Ezekiel 37. And they're going to become an exceedingly great army. Now, they came out of the Holocaust as refugees, but after the wars they've been through, they become an ex they're becoming a great army, and they will become an exceedingly great army as they fulfill the prophecies, like the one we just read in Obadiah, as well as others. So I, I just want your viewers to realize when, when they see things like the Iron Dome uh, taking out incoming missiles, intercepting them, when they see assassinations of military and political leaders that are troubling them, part of those enemies around them, that's prophetic. You're watching Bible prophecy manifest as Israel burgeons into this exceedingly great army. So after they defeat the Palestinians, it goes on to say in Obadiah 1, verses 19 through 20. Then my people, of course, that's Israel, living in the Negev will occupy the mountains of Edom, which are southern Jordan. They'll take over part of southern Jordan. I'll show you an image on that. Uh, they, those living in the foothills of Judah will possess the Philistine plains. That's, of course, the Gaza, the Hamas are. We will say goodbye to Hamas because they will no longer be there when this happens. They will take over the fields of Ephraim and Samaria. That's where the West Bank is. Israel will possess that. The exiles of Israel will return to their land and occupy the Phoenician coast so far north as Zarephath. Okay, here we go. Zarephath is sandwiched in between Sidon and Tyre. It's about 11 miles south of Sidon. It's in Lebanon, a coastal city. In, in uh, 1 Kings 17, 9, I believe it is, we're told that Sidon actually owns Zarephath. I want to make a note for your viewers that in the Old Testament, Tyre and Sidon are mentioned together in the same verses 17 times. So they're historically and prophetically, they're pretty much connected to the hip. We're finding them in prophecies that are unfulfilled. Ezekiel 28 and Psalm 83. Now we're looking at Obadiah, and they're going to possess Zarephath. Now, that is in southern Lebanon, and the captives of Jerusalem from Jerusalem exiled in the north will return home and reset, resettle the towns of the Negev. Now, what's interesting. Hezbollah does have a footprint in Zarephath. Zarephath is known as modern-day Zarephan, which is S-A-R-A-F-A-N-D. You can find it on a map today. Here's a couple of headlines that are worth noting to show that Hezbollah has a stronghold not only in Sidon, where they have weapons depots, as we talked about, not only in Tyre, which they have a heavy footprint there, but also now in Zarephath, ancient Zarephath, modern-day Zarephan. It says in the City News on July 17th of 2013, we're going to go back you know, over a decade. It says a gunman killed outspoken pro-regime Syrian journalist in Hezbollah's stronghold in Lebanon. So this is an offside off story that was considered a stronghold in Lebanon in 2013. Uh, it says on Wednesday he was gunned down with the automatic rifle shot at close range in his apartment in the coastal town of Serafan. That, that's where the stronghold is, a stronghold of Hezbollah. So just trying to make a connection here. And there's another um, interesting headline that came out actually a week after Hezbollah engaged with Israel on October 8th. That's so on October 16th. Here's what it says. The Washington Institute for Near East Policy writes this. Will Hezbollah, was, will Hezbollah hold back on or escalate? And it goes on to say, uh, there's been a systemized evacuation or request for residents to leave in the coastal towns of Tyre or Serafan, or in Danias, as well as Stronghold, and Beirut's southern suburbs. So evacuations, um, also in southern Lebanon, but we find also Zarephan is where Hezbollah has a stronghold. So all I'm trying to say there is basically what happens is that that area will be taken over by Israel. So is it possible that a ground invasion ensues and Israel moves to the north? And Zarephath would be, of course, considered part of the Promised Land which we're told in Genesis 15, verses uh, yeah, verses 18, I think it is. The land is given to Abraham from the river of Egypt, probably the Nile. 
all the way through to the river Euphrates. The great river Euphrates was courses through modern day Syria and Iraq. So Israel is going to con include Zarephath as part of their promised land. They're going to make a, a move forward and capture that. Probably, uh, I mean, that's right below Sidon. So it probably finds a connection. Ezekiel 28, Psalm 83 with Tyre and Gabal and Obadiah with Zarephath. But what's interesting is that Israel is going to actually take over parts of, we're told in uh, Obadiah 1, verses 19 through 20, as I read that to your viewers, they're going to take over parts of southern Jordan, the mountains of Esau, the Gaza, where Felicia is and Hamas, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, the Golan Heights, um, part of Gilead, per se, I think it was said there, and southern Lebanon and Zarephath. So we have probably four cities that are involved in unfulfilled prophecies in Psalm 83, Obadiah, and Ezekiel 28. Those cities would be, as we reviewed, Gabal, moving from north to south, Sidon, Zarephath, and Tyre. And I think this culminates in Zechariah 12, a final siege, we're told, in Zechariah 12, verses 2 through 6. And we're told in Zechariah 12 that the countries around Israel, the surrounding peoples, the pricking briar, the painful thorn of Ezekiel 28, will be judged so that Israel can dwell safely, build houses and plant vineyards. They have to be dealt with. We're told in, they're going to lay a final siege. And here's what it says in Zechariah 12, verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. In some translations, that's dizziness or drunkenness, a cup of dizziness or drunkenness. Unto all the people round about, the pricking briar, uh, uh, round about them. And when they, they siege, both in the siege against Judah and against Jerusalem, then when they try to do that, a final siege on Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is the third holiest city in Islam, although it's not mentioned one time in the Quran. They're going to make a final siege on Judah and Jerusalem, try to take it over this freaking briar, and what, what's going to happen is going to be a bad move for them. We fast forward to Ezekiel, excuse me, Zechariah 12, verse 6. And in that day when the Jerusalem's a cup of trembling and the siege is about, I will make the governors, or read that as the Israeli defense forces, the captains of Judah, like a fire pan in the wood pile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples, all the freaking briar on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. So this is what I'm kind of looking for here all in advance of Ezekiel 38, Jamie, Janie. I think that uh, we're going to see Sidon go down first. Uh, that's where Hezbollah has a stronghold. They have weapons depots there by precision guided missiles that they want to use against Israel. Israel does not have the luxury. Matter of fact, let's look at something very important here before I summarize on this. I want to go all the way to a headline that talks about Israel's concerns about this war with Hezbollah. This was back in 2022. And bear with me. Here we go. Israel National News. This is very important for your viewers to, to hear about. Uh, this was back in August 7th of 2023, so before the Hamas attack on October 7th. The predicted scenario. 6,000 rockets at Israel during the first few days of war with Hezbollah, 6,000 missiles. It goes on to say Israel's defense establishment is preparing for the worst case scenario during a war on the northern border, which would include days long blockouts, hundreds dead, and thousands wounded. It says within the first days, about 6,000 rockets would be launched at the Jewish state. As time progresses, the number would decline to about only 1,500 to 2,000 rockets a day. Security experts estimate that every day there will be approximately 1,500 effective strikes in Israeli territory, and that is after subtracting rockets that statistically land in open areas and interceptions by the Iron Dome system. Now, let's let's step back and, and evaluate that. Hezbollah lobbed 4,000 missiles into Israel over 34 days back in 2006 and kept northern Israelis in bomb shelters throughout that whole month, pretty much. We're talking about 6,000 missiles in one day, the first few days. The Iron Dome can intercept maybe 20 or 30 of those. I mean, I'm not a military analyst, but I don't think it's much more than that. They're aiming at Haifa. They're aiming at Tel Aviv. Uh, I believe there's concerns if you look at Isaiah 17, 4 through 6, and the destruction of Damascus prophecy, where Israel takes a severe hit. It says the glory of Jacob will fade and his flesh will wax lean. And there'll be a shaking there like an olive tree. 
And by the time the olive tree is shaken, there'll be two or three olives in the, to the north in the uppermost branches and three or four in the fruitful boughs. And if you superimpose an olive tree over Israel, you'll see that an olive tree, a fruited variety, can have about 500,000 olives. There's a shaking. Jacob's glory fades, his, fle his flesh waxes lean as a result of that Syrian conflict. And Syria, Isaiah 17, Syria is also a proxy of Iran, the Bashar al-Assad regime. I think Isaiah 17 is going to find a connection in all the things we've been talking about. So we're talking about 6,000 missiles a day coming in. Israel will not be able to handle that. There will be casualties. They're preparing for it. Days-long blackouts, hundreds dead. In fact, as we record this, there was a headline that came out. I don't have it in front of me, but talked about Israel's been preparing all their hospitals for such, an, such a situation as this. Um, blackouts. And they've actually turned in the north, they've turned some parking lots, underground parking lots, into triage centers. This is already happening right now. Um, so basically, and then it goes into 1,500 or 2,000 effective missiles landing and hitting their targets. Now, that's not to mention Iran sending in their missiles. Uh, that's not to mention Bashar al Assad sending in chemical weapons that he used over 300 times in his revolution with his, in his country. That's not to mention whatever's left of Hamas that's lobbing missiles in. And they're sort of refortifying themselves as this Gaza war continues on. That's not to mention the Houthis that have been, that sent a, a missile into the Tel Aviv area. I think it was a drone. And they threatened they're going to do more. That's not to mention the Iraqi, the Iran proxies of the Iraqi Shiite militias inside of Iraq that have been attacking American bases. Um, so we're talking about things escalating probably very soon into a level that's of epic biblical proportions and having prophetic implications. You know, I, it's amazing how many Bible prophecies you, you just dis discussed on just this program. I mean, because there are so many that people overlook. Now, um, can you all, and we definitely need to be praying for Israel and praying for innocent people uh, that the Lord will protect them. And uh, can you also just uh, go back to, you know, some of the arguments of some people saying, ah, eh, nah, Ezekiel 28, that was already fulfilled. Could you just go into some of those? I can. And I think we should, because we don't want to sensationalize Bible prophecy if it's already been historically fulfilled. Like I said, one of the reasons I don't think it's already been historically fulfilled is because Sidon exists today and Israel is bombing it bombing around it, as we read in the headlines. But that's not proof in the pudding. We need to look a little deeper. So um, one of the expositors, most all commentaries are going to say that the Ezekiel 28 prophecy with Sidon has already found fulfillment. Uh, I don't agree, and I'll give you the reasons why. Um, but let's look at a couple of the prevalent arguments to make sure that we're correct. Uh, John Gill writes in his John Gill's exposition. Now, John Gill was between 1697 and 1771. He says regarding Ezekiel 28, Sidon, in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side, this was literally fulfilled in Sidon either by Nebuchadnezzar or by and the Chaldean army, which besieged it on every side, or by Artaxerxes, Oxus the Persian, who took it and destroyed it, and that was in 351 B.C., so he presents the two primary arguments, the main one being the Nebuchadnezzar argument. We'll look at that. But before we do, I think it's really important to remember the reasons for God's uh, enmity with Sidon and the judgment and the results from it. We have to look at those because that's important. Uh, and, and we're going to find out in the process of doing that that these historical fulfillments really didn't happen, that they were different reasons for and different results from. So the reasons for by way of review, the two times in Ezekiel 28 verses 20, 21, God declares that God is against Sidon. But why? Ezekiel 28 verses 24 through 26 tells us the reason that Sidon is one of Israel's neighbors that is a pricking briar and a painful thorn to the existence of the Jewish state. These evil neighbors despise Israel and stand in the way of them expanding into a safe dwelling, house building, and vineyard planting nation. This has nothing to do with idolatry, which we're going to find some of these commentaries suggest God was going to root out idolatry, and that's why uh, he had this judgment on Sidon. That's not anything that we've read about in Ezekiel 28, verses 20 through 26. We've read about the fact that God's upset because they're not allowing Israel to dwell safely. They're like a pricking briar. 
The results from the Sidon judgment are Sidon will be soundly defeated in a military conflict by the sword on every side. They'll send pestilence into her streets, blood in her streets, the wounded will be in her midst. And when it's all over, Ezekiel that pronounces four times that they, it will be of the magnitude that the, they should know that I, they shall know that I am the Lord. So did those reasons for and results from happen in these episodes? Keep that in mind as we read them. First, we look at the King Nebuchadnezzar II. Nebuchadnezzar II would be at that time of the argument. So we'll look at the Geneva Study Bible. We'll look at maybe three commentaries on this, short ones. Geneva Study Bible says, For I will send into her pestilence and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst by her, by the sword upon her on every side. And they shall know that I am the Lord that is Nebuchadnezzar. So he's advocating Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar II fulfilled that prophecy during the Babylonian period. Halley, Henry Halley in his Halley's hand, Bible handbook says this. He was in between 1874 and 1965. He says, chapter 28, referring to Ezekiel, verses 20 through 24, the overthrow of Sidon, 20 miles north of Tyre. It was taken by Nebuchadnezzar when he took Tyre. So here's two advocates that Nebuchadnezzar fulfilled it, not really giving us reasons per se. Wearsby will be the next one. He gives us what he believes is the reason, which will be idolatry. And here's what he says. Uh, Warren Wearsby in his Bible commentary, he was between 1929 and 2019. He says the people of Sidon despise the Jews and often cause trouble for them. But now that opposition would end. They shall know that I am the Lord their God, Ezekiel 28, verses 24. Ezekiel makes the startling statement that God would be glorified in the destruction of the city. But how could the Lord be glorified in such carnage, by such carnage? Because it would demonstrate his holiness in rejecting false gods and punishing sin. The swords of Babylonian soldiers would kill many of the people, and those who escaped would die in the plagues that often accompany wartime slaughter. So he's clearly saying that the judgment of Sidon was to root out idolatry. Um, a case in point, 300 years prior to Ezekiel, the Phoenician princess Jezebel, uh, she was spreading her idolatrous practices throughout Israel and the region. So clearly Sidon was idolatrous, but that's not the reasons for the judgment. And that's clearly what he's saying it was. So the reasons aren't there. for and they're, they're not giving us reasons in the Geneva Study Bible. Or Halley's Bible Handbook that we read, Wiersbe is saying it's idolatry, but that's let's look at. I don't know how much time we have, but I think it's important to look at a couple things. What was really happening, biblically and historically, during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar? Because that's the primary argument. Can we turn our attention to Jeremiah chapter two, twenty-seven, chapter twenty-seven, verses two through eleven? I'm going to read it, Janie, if it's okay, uh, because it's very important. Do we have the time for me to read the, the prophecy? Oh, absolutely, yes. I love learning. <laughs> okay. Um, Jeremiah, who is Ezekiel's contemporary, he writes, he probably writes this prophecy around 590 or so BC, uh, around the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, remember the Babylonians had three conquests of Judah. And I think it was 587 or so, 597 perhaps it was, was the first one. Uh, and he writes around that time, just to put a, a time stamp on it. Here's what he says. I've highlighted on the slide that you'll be looking at these verses and the important parts. Thus says the Lord to me, Jeremiah, make yourself a bond and yokes and put them on your neck and send them to the king of Edom, Moab, Ammonites, Tyre, and the king of Sidon, by the hand of their messengers, their ambassadors, who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, he was the king of Judah at that time, and command them to say to their masters, their kings, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I have given them, given it to them whom I seem, it seems proper to me. And now I have given, this is Jeremiah 27, verses 6 through 8, and I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field I have also given him to serve him. So all the nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his end this land comes. And then many nations and great kings shall make him, I shall make them serve him. 
And it shall be that that nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put his neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and the nation I will, I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. So basically what he's saying here, he's giving Sidon an opportunity, a warning to submit to Nebuchadnezzar and be spared and to survive. He goes on to conclude verses 9 to 11. Therefore, do not listen to your prophets. He's talking to Sidon and the other ambassadors. Your diviners, dreamers, soothsayers, or sorcerers who speak to you saying you shall not serve the king of Babylon. Because that's what they were saying. Just like the, the false prophets during Jeremiah's time were saying, don't listen to Jeremiah. He's prophesying lies to you. But here's what he says. Do not listen to them. You shall not serve the king of Babylon. That's what they were saying. Don't listen to them. For they prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and they shall dwell in it. So imagine the scenario. Jeremiah's got this ox yoke on his neck. These ambassadors have come for their kings, uh, and they've come to get a message from Jeremiah about the territorial futures, realizing that Babylon is taking over. They've already conquered Judah the first time, etc. They're concerned. They're not coming as a pricking briar or as a painful thorn. They're coming in a friendly diplomatic scenario, and as I see it, to ask Jeremiah, inquire of him, hey, well, you're predicting the future of Judah. What about us? And the Lord honors their request, and he tells them what's going to happen. You're going to be taken over unless you submit, and you will survive. And so that's exactly what they did. Let's read the historical account. That's the biblical account. Jeremiah gave them a warning. And remember Ezekiel, when he writes shortly thereafter, in Ezekiel 20, he's not giving them a warning. He's not giving them, hey, you can get out of jail free if you just submit to Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying, you're going into judgment. You're not going to escape it. It's going to be bloody. That's not, that Jeremiah says that's not the case. And that was at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So here's what the public commentary of homiletics says by W. Jones. I will send pestilence into her. I will send into her pestilence and blood in her streets, and the wounded shall fall in the midst of her, and the sword upon her on every side. This judgment by pestilence and sword could hardly be said to have happened when executed in the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, seeing that Sidon submitted to him apparently without offering any serious resistance. So, according to one historical account here, they, Sidon did listen to Jeremiah. They did heed his warnings and sub submitted to Nebuchadnezzar. And we have this from uh, the Associates for Biblical Research, another uh, historical account of what they found. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieged Tyre for 13 years. But the precise historical facts of its outcome are still unclear. He evidently did not conquer the city, but it may have surrendered conditionally to him, Tyre and Sidon, so Tyre. Both Jeremiah and Ezekiel give accounts of this event. Apparently, both Tyre and Sidon surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar based on a fragmentary Babylonian administrative document, which mentions the king of Sire, king of Tyre and Sidon as receiving rations from the royal Babylonian household. So they submitted, they survived, they received rations from Babylon, they tilled their own soil, uh, they heeded Jeremiah's request. Therefore, uh, they were not a pricking briar at the time, and they did sur surrender and heed Jeremiah's request, so therefore it did not fulfill the prophecy in my estimation. You know, there's human lives here now that are going to be slain. I mean, they're, they're concerned about bombs coming inside, and rightfully so. Uh, this thing is going to get bad, and if this prophecy is not found fulfillment, it's about to. And I really think it's about two. I agree. No, I totally, yeah. Once I heard it and everything, and then just looking at all the headlines with Hezbollah, I'm like, yeah, this is like, we're seconds away. Well, Israel needs to be safe. They need to build homes. They need to plant vineyards. Uh, it's gotten to a point now, they've, they've struggled with that for a long time, as you know, trying to uh, build houses and stuff in the rest, the West Bank, the, the, the presidential administrations, most all of them have said, don't do that. It doesn't help the two-state solution. Those are settlements. They're you know, occupied, they're illegal, et cetera. That's already been a problem for many years, but now it's just not happening at all. The pricking briar is so bad and painful thorn is so bad 
But basically, Israel can't build. They can't. The people. There's about sixty percent of these evacuees aren't even. They're not even sure they're going to go back to, to northern Lebanon. Uh, it's just. It's terrible. And so something's got to give. Right. To something. Yeah. That Iran's going to get a nuclear weapon. So I mean, it's all. It's all right at Israel's front doorstep. Right. Right. So something has to change in order before Ezekiel thirty-eight, like you said. So. Yeah, pretty amazing. And most all the guys right now are basically saying, watch out for Ezekiel 38. And I'm like, well, that's a very important prophecy. But we're not there yet. You know, don't overlook that you know, Ezekiel 28 has to happen. Psalm 83, Zechariah 12, Obadiah 1, and many, many more places. So, for instance, uh, just between you and I, uh, Jeremiah 49, verses 2, and Zephaniah 2 talks about Jordan, who has that fragile peace treaty with Israel being conquered by the Israeli defense forces and annexed by Israel. And that's part of the promised land. That's all part of the fray too. There's so many peripheral prophecies that are all part of what we're just talking about here. Uh, so even though that fragile peace treaty exists, it won't exist much longer. Neither will Egypt's because Isaiah 19, we're told that uh, Egypt's going to be involved in a conflict with Judah, Isaiah verses 19, 1 through 18. And that treaty is going to be gone. It says five cities will speak the language of Canaan and Egypt. As a result, that's Hebrew. Israel will move into that territory as well. So this stuff's all right in front of us right now. And that, to me, is all before Ezekiel 38. This was an amazing teaching. Can you tell everyone how to, uh, where what website they can find uh, your information, your books, and also uh, a link is on there, too, um, to follow along with uh, this teaching. So, yeah, tell, tell everyone what your website is. Well, thank you, Janie. And it's, it's always great to be on your program. Thank you again. Um, my website is prophecydepot.com, prophecy depot like home depot.com. We have all my articles there. We have an online store you can click on for our products, books, and DVDs. We also have, you can click on it, a daily newsstand called prophecyheadlines.com. You can go to prophecyheadlines.com. And you'll be seeing uh, a lot of activity going on that may have prophetic implications. That's, that's what we try to do with the articles we put there. We also have a YouTube channel that you can check out as well. If you just search Bill Salus, S-A-L-U-S, you'll find it. So, Janie, thank you for, again for having me on your program. Thank you so much. 